W5. No matter how much you treat the superbug, it will never go away. A looming epidemic threatens millions. We need to be bold. We need to take risks. I wanted to live. Doesn't it worry everyone? It should worry everyone. And we never dreamed we'd catch a seven-foot white shark here. Tracking an apex predator through Canadian waters. I'm not out there trying to be a daredevil. He's on it, Brett, 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 he's on it, he's on it. There is a whole white shark Atlantic Canada puzzle. CTV's W5 with Avis Favreau, Todd Battis, and Lisa Laflamme. Here is Avis Favreau. Welcome to W5. The word superbug should worry us all. They are antibiotic resistant bacteria that cause infections which are pretty well impossible to beat. But now there may be hope from a long forgotten Canadian discovery using viruses found all around us, even in sewage, to target bacteria and to stop infections dead. You're looking at microscopic killers, bacteria that cause infections that are tough, sometimes impossible to kill, even with the most powerful antibiotics. These superbugs are a growing threat to our health. Already, they kill some 700,000 people around the world every year. And they nearly ended the life of Tom Patterson. I've been at death's door. I've seen what it is to be close to death. His stunning recovery, thanks to his Canadian-born scientist wife, Stephanie Strathdy, who resurrected a 100-year-old treatment discovered in Canada to save Tom and perhaps other lives throughout the world. If we can do this for one man, we can do it for the planet. Their story begins in 2015, when Tom, a professor of psychiatry, and Stephanie, a longtime AIDS researcher, were on a trip in Egypt. After a meal, Tom came down with what everyone thought was food poisoning. An hour later, I woke up and I was throwing up like you wouldn't have believed. And Steph is like, ah, you know, you got food poisoning, no big deal. And then it got worse. It got way worse. When he started complaining of back pain, that's when I realized that this really doesn't look like food poisoning and we need to get him some help. Airlifted to a hospital in Frankfurt, Germany, the doctors diagnosed something far more sinister. Tom was infected with a deadly superbug called Acinetobacter baumani. And the doctors said there's a giant abscess in his abdomen the size of a small football. And the doctor picked up this flask and he was showing me this murky brown putrid fluid. You're a scientist. When you saw that murky brown liquid, what did you think? I knew that that meant that there was some bacteria that was growing inside the cyst in his abdomen. But um, I figured, well, there's antibiotics that are going to cure that. Tom was airlifted back to the US and to the University of California San Diego Health Center where infectious disease specialist, Dr. Robert Schooley, took on the case. When did you get worried? It was clear that we had uncontrolled infection. Did you think you might lose him? There were many times when we thought that was quite possible, yeah. He'd fallen prey to one of the most frightening scenarios, spreading bacteria that had developed resistance to all known antibiotics and was now in a coma. This organism that was living inside this abscess in his abdomen was resistant to all antibiotics. There wasn't a single antibiotic left in modern medicine's arsenal to kill it. By that time, he was had been on respirator for some time. He was uh, nearly comatose uh, from systemic effects of the infection. He was on three different medications to maintain a blood pressure. His kidneys were failing, and he was beginning to develop liver failure. So he was developing multi-organ failure. You know, it's hard to predict how long he would have lived, but it uh, would have been inevitable that something would have uh, pushed him over the edge. What was going through your head at this point? I guess I just didn't realize that he was dying a little bit more each day. And until I heard a colleague of mine on the phone 
make a comment um, when he thought I'd hung up. And he said, has anybody told Steph that her husband is going to die? I cradled the phone in my arms and I thought, no, nobody has. And I realized, wow, like, they just don't want to tell me. In hospital for months with no medical options left, she asked Tom for a sign. I took his hand and I said, honey, I know that you've been fighting really hard and that you're really tired. So if you want to live, I need to know. And if you could squeeze my hand, tell me that you want to live, I will leave no stone unturned. And about a minute later, he squeezed my hand really hard. You wanted to communicate something to her? Yes. What? I wanted to live. And I just fist pumped my you know, blue gloved hand in the air. And I thought, yes. And then I thought, oh crap, what do I do now? You know, like, I'm not a medical doctor. So Stephanie launched an urgent search recalling something she'd learned back as a student at the University of Toronto, a story about viruses that eat bacteria. They're called phages. 100 times smaller than bacteria, they find and lock on to specific bacteria, inject their DNA to produce more phages, so many that the bacteria explodes and billions of these new phages are released to repeat the cycle. That's pretty cool, huh? And I sat back and I thought, I wonder if we could get these phages to treat Tom's infection. But phages have been largely off the radar for Western medicine since they were discovered over 100 years ago by a French-Canadian scientist, Félix de Herel. He used phages to treat some patients with dysentery and typhoid plague. But antibiotics were easier to make and more profitable, sending phages to the fringes of the scientific world. But as Tom lay dying in his hospital room, Stephanie and the doctors took a chance on that phage therapy. Where they're from is the crazy part. Where you go to find phages is where you have a lot of bacteria. So the perfect place to find them is in sewage. And that's exactly what you'll find here in the labs at UC San Diego, where Dr. David Pride, associate director of the Clinical Microbiology Lab, has long been fascinated by these neglected phages and has been collecting them for his own research. From sewage. From sewage. That would make people a little squeamish. Well, um, it probably shouldn't, uh, and it probably shouldn't because phages are absolutely everywhere. You can look in the water, you can look on surfaces, you can look in any different part of the body, and they're absolutely teeming with bacteriophages. The quest was to find the exact strain of phages that would kill Tom's infections, a process of trial and error, so phages are extracted and purified and then tested in a dish. We'll put a drop of them on a plate, we'll mark where we drop them, and we look to see is there any evidence that the bacteria uh, is being killed by that bacteriophage. Uh, and how do you know? Well, it clears. Um, so, so the entire plate is cloudy. Where you see that it's clear means that that bacteria has been killed. So when we find that clearance, we know that our phage is capable of killing that bacteria. The team working on Tom's case found several phages they thought would work against his infection when all antibiotics had failed. Okay, here we are, we're having Megan administer phage therapy. And then they injected billions of phages into his abdomen, even right into his bloodstream with no guarantees it would work. That was the scariest moment when I had to sign this consent form that I knew my husband was dying, I knew we were gonna try an experimental, unproven cure that could kill him, but I'm gonna do it anyway because, you know, it's like... What choice did you have? Yeah, there was none. He was literally within hours of dying, I was told. When did you notice a change? We started the phage therapy on March 15th of 2016. On March 20th, Tom woke up, lifted his head off the pillow and kissed his daughter's hand. And everybody freaked out. Within five days, Tom was up, starting to walk. Oh, this is amazing. I've never 
and soon strong enough to thank his medical team. So do you want to say something to those doctors who worked around the clock? Oh, my God. It's up to them. They're going to say it. I am because of their love. Yes. And many credit the phages for saving his life. My favorite line is, you know, that my husband was cured with phage therapy. I can literally say he's full of shit. Did it occur to you that this was a historic case? I'm a skeptical, cynical person. And uh, one of the things you don't want to do is jump up and down and say, Eureka, now we have discovered the key to all multi-drug resistant bacterial infections. When what you really had was a guy who got lucky. But I was elated to see it. I thought this could be something really big. Dance for us, Tom. With Tom now back to good health, he and Stephanie are on a mission to start testing phages in more patients to see if they are indeed a new way to beat superbugs. It's clear that antibiotics are not the solution to this problem. And if you've been given life like I have, what are you going to do? You got to give back. And that's what we're trying to do. It makes you emotional. Absolutely. I feel like, how can you be so close to death and then just walk away from it? It's an opportunity for me to give back to the world. Coming up. We are still struggling to get past regulatory hurdles. Fighting for access to treatment. I need something to work. When W5 continues. All I really wanted was to have my husband back for one more day. Superbugs almost killed Tom Patterson. He was saved by phage therapy, viruses that attack bacteria. And many think they may be a possible weapon in the war against drug-resistant microbes. People need to understand that antibiotic resistance is the coming plague and that we all need to be aware of that. And this is a potential solution. We've been told that up until Tom's case that there was no public face for superbugs. And I looked at Tom and he looked at me and I said, well, you're it. So a year ago, he and his wife, Stephanie, launched IPATH, the first phage therapy center in North America at the University of California, San Diego, that connects doctors and their patients suffering from untreatable infections with researchers collecting phages. DC1 looks like it's uh, infecting well. Like Canadian microbiologist John Dennis at the University of Alberta. For over a decade, he has been sounding the alarm over failing antibiotics and the need to fast track phage research. Does this something you carry with you and you're worried about? Doesn't it worry everyone? It should worry everyone. Are we going to look at traditional medicines like chemical antibiotics or are we going to try something new that hasn't been tried before? Here's the path. And this is where phage medicine begins in nature. OK, so what's the objective, quarterback? The objective is to get dirt near the roots of different plants. We don't know which ones have the best potential for therapy, so we just yeah. have to sample them all. So it's like sifting for gold? Yeah. Sifting for gold. Yeah. The scientist and his students search farm fields, for pumpkin patch? Well, there's a big gourd there. And forests to find phages that will cure human diseases. Wherever there are rotting plants, there's bacteria and the phages that have evolved to attack that strain of bug. Call it digging for medicine. And among the most dangerous superbugs, says Dennis, are the horrific lung infections attacking patients with cystic fibrosis. Many are dying because their superbugs can't be treated. You could say CF patients are the canary in the cold mine, that what's happening to them will be happening to us. So he set up a phage factory at the University of Alberta, where scientists separate the phages from the dirt 
and then test to see which ones attack and kill infections, taken from samples from sick patients. It's a challenging way of making medicine. They're not like chemical drugs, which will treat hundreds of patients. And so um, this is really personalized medicine. This is a, a prime example of this one medicine for one patient, and it's going to save their lives. All those are different phages that we can test immediately. His lab has sent phages to treat several American patients with cystic fibrosis, but Health Canada has not approved the use of phages yet, even though they were discovered here long ago. Sure, yeah, I would love to see that. I, it would be a, a full circle story where something discovered in Canada now is being used to treat Canadians years later. And in Canada, we are still struggling to get past regulatory hurdles. Uh, we can't even speak. If you want to see the suffering caused by these superbugs, watch Nicole Stringer's video diaries. She's having like a lot of pain in my chest because I'm coughing a lot right now. <laughs> oh God, I need something to work because I can't do this. This is her daily struggle with cystic fibrosis, which makes her vulnerable to chest infections. Some are resistant to all antibiotics, and it may cost her her life. What does it mean to have a superbug? It means never truly being well, because you, no matter how much you treat the superbug, it will never go away. So um, <clears throat> the pills that I take she controls her symptoms with an array of pills, hoping to stay out of hospital. I have to have Tylenol on me all the time because I run a lot of fevers. I have my anti-nausea medications. There's a hundred of these every day. Yes, yes, it's shocking. Just to stay stable. Yes. I have my puffers, which I take four times a day. And that's why Nicole has become the first Canadian CF patient to get phage therapy traveling with her husband, Ben, to Yale New Haven Hospital in Connecticut. I'm 27 and I'm at a point where this is my last resort, pretty much. It's only gonna go downhill from here. So phage is giving me the hope of maybe having somewhat of a normal life. Hey, great to see you. Take a seat. Dr. Jonathan Koff is the cystic fibrosis specialist monitoring Nicole's treatment. This part of it is completely experimental in the sense that this is a compassionate use approach. You're one of 13 people that we have treated. Nicole has a multidrug resistant pseudomonas that is not responding to our available uh, interventions. <coughs> so why don't we go ahead and do the treatment now? In this vial are billions of phages. Let's go ahead and pour it in. Nicole is one of 13 patients treated with phages so far here at Yale and the doctors plan to launch a larger study. We're seeing very clearly that we're dramatically decreasing the amount of bacteria that's in the sputum during the treatment and then after, which is very encouraging. And the improvements in lung function, what are you seeing? We've had a couple of those patients respond on the order of 13% improvement. And that's on the, uh, that's on the order of, of some of the best therapies in, in cystic fibrosis. But again, these are small patient numbers and we have to do our due diligence with, with clinical trials, but it certainly gives us some optimism that this type of intervention could be effective. We have the remaining doses here. And so the first time you took them, what changes, improvements did you notice? About three to four hours after my very, very first dose, I could smell flowers for the first time in about 15 years. My lungs started feeling like I could breathe a little bit better. Her phages came from municipal sewage, found by phage hunter and Yale scientist Ben Chan. A lot of doctors don't even know about it. It's a little bit strange. It's been around a long time, but just hasn't been like pursued, right? And it's sort of now in the past maybe three years, given this like a new life. But at the same time, we should always be skeptical, right? Like there's a few cases, we've treated quite a few and we've seen really positive results, but like don't believe me, like believe data. And the price can't be beat. 
What does it cost to make phages for a patient? And, and just materials and, and chemicals is really cheap. Um, so maybe a dollar a dose at the most. A dollar a dose. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Um, and, that, and just parts, right? And, and I think that's been one of the things that's, that's made it a little bit difficult for investors or whatever to get involved and get behind it to try and push this and, and advance it to like a, a treatment that you'd see in clinics everywhere. So, uh, and then we'll see you on Friday. Most frustrating for Nicole is that this dose of hope hasn't been available closer to home. Would you like to see this tested in Canada? 100%. It, if, if there was a chance to get the phage without coming here, I would do that without a doubt. She and her husband Ben have to wait to see if the phages will beat her drug-resistant bacteria. There are still many unanswered questions and work ahead. We went to hell and back. But and Stephanie and Tom are determined this promising treatment will never be lost again. A Canadian solution that was discovered 100 years ago, Canadians should be at the forefront. We have some of the best scientific minds in the world. And um, we need to be bold. We need to take risks. And um, if we hadn't been bold in my husband's case, he would be dead. I'm privileged to be alive today. And it is, I think, my duty. I'd rather forget it, walk away, just live an ordinary life. But I'm saving lives, I believe, in talking to people and representing evidence-based hope that even when you're this close to death, as close to death as I was, you can survive and that phages may be a potential solution to this huge crisis that we're on the brink of. Health Canada tells W5 it will consider Canadian phage studies if and when doctors ask.